<laughs> Kristen Dunst looks so good in this scene. I do love the colors. I will say that from a costume point of view. Like, it became a costume with the fan. But yeah. other than that, I yeah, good scene. Very, very nice. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic scene. Great <laughs> costuming. <laughs> also. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Art of Costume Podcast. I'm Elizabeth Joy Glass. Et je suis Spencer Williams. Bonjour, Elizabeth. <laughs> Bonjour, Spencer. <laughs> that was terrible French, but <laughs> I hit up Google Translate before this. Yeah, you know what's pathetic? I took three years of French and don't remember a single thing. Oh, that's how I am with Spanish, too. Yeah. And my one French teacher that I had for two years was like French. Like from France and oh. literally nothing. Oh man. Yeah, I took Spanish forever. Like I think we started first grade and went all the oh way my to gosh. Yeah, first grade, because you know, I live in Southern California. Mm -hmm. I th believe I went all the way to junior year of high school, maybe maybe sophomore, at least sophomore. But I feel like I just for so many of those years, we learned the same things over and over and over, like yeah. colors, months of the year, like simple things. Or after a while, you're like, okay, okay, I get it. Like I, I could say the days of the week, but then you wait all the way till high school, and suddenly we're like learning how to actually speak it. But by that point, I was, <laughs> I was over yeah. it. <laughs> you're like, I can't do this now. <laughs> I'm just trying to graduate, bro. <laughs> yeah, I would love to learn like other languages it's just like every time i like like get into it i'm just like english is too different from yeah <laughs> like i have a hard time finding like a bridge where i'm like yeah i can understand this and like well they have those apps now where you could just like learn a language on your phone that's i, 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 like I try that person, <laughs> <laughs> you can learn language on your <laughs> cellular device now i do have duolingo but it's just like uh, who has the time who yeah. has the time? You, you know and who I, had the not time? really. No. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I like, gosh, I have a hard time just finding time to do what I actually want to. Yeah. I, I got behind this week because I'm like, you know what? I got home, like, I wasn't closing, but I also, like, wasn't didn't get home early from work. And I was like, oh, I should do X, Y, and Z. And I was like, No. I'm going to watch Star Trek Enterprise and play The Sims. And that is how my <laughs> evening is going. <laughs> no, I feel you. I, I worked, I don't know, like 14 hour days every day for the past like six days. Ew, so, Spencer, why? You know, I just got to get that bag, as they say. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I just hate myself. <laughs> but I'm excited to be here with you. I've been looking Same. forward to this week's episode of Hot Girl Summer. Yes. Because um, this is the most hot girl of all hot girl costume design films we could watch. Absolutely. Absolutely. Spencer, what did we watch this week? This week, we watched the 2000 and... Well, let me say that again. Blah, 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 blah. This week, we watched the 2000, 2006 film, Marie Antoinette. I cannot say 2006. <laughs> were you trying... You, I, I, it sounded like you were going to say 2007. I was like, Spencer, that's that's incorrect. 2000. Thousand. That's kind of a weird word, isn't it? Anyways, we watched Marie Antoinette. <laughs> As we said last week, I have never seen this film, but yet I hear everyone talk about all the time costume designer melina cananero it's just an iconic film and i'm so excited for i got to watch it because i absolutely loved it elizabeth i know this is like one of the best um period films especially for costume it's like what were your like first thoughts first thoughts um because it, it's, it's different it's definitely a different kind of film Right. It, I was very excited about it, actually. I thought it was going to be, like, very, um, I don't know, I guess kind of, like, a, not dry, but a little bit like the Emma films, Pride and Prejudice, like, I, which mm -hmm. I know totally different time periods, but very just kind of, like, it wasn't period in the sense that this felt like a modern retelling of the story. I saw one of the summaries said that this was, like, an electric retelling of the story of Marie yeah. Antoinette, which I thought was really cool because that's how I would describe it. It was very 
punk and very modern. You know, the music was very fun. So I loved it. It, it was great. I loved every scene. It is, it is such a great film. And I feel like it's one of the first that kind of does that, like, oh, the music is really important, but it's like modern, more modern music. Yeah. It's, it's not appropriate to the period. Um, so it's really interesting. And why don't you start us off with a summary, Spencer? Okay. From her marriage to the French Dauphine Louis at 14 and their rise to the throne at 19, Marie Antoinette is a modern retelling of France's most iconic but ill-fated queen. And that is Marie Antoinette. If you have not seen Marie Antoinette, it is free on Hulu. Go, go watch it. Be free. It's very good. <laughs> it's very good. It's very, it's a, it's a weird er movie. It's definitely not there like there's no central storyline right it's literally just her living her life it was kind of like her living her life but in like a series of art i don't know it just felt like yeah. an art film just kind of seeing her life play from like beginning to end i felt like all the context of what's actually happening because it didn't matter we all know how it ends yeah we all know how it ends and it's like because she she liked telling Sophia Coppola wanted to tell Marie Antoinette's story from like a sympathetic viewpoint because right. it's like she was literally raised to go have babies like yeah. <laughs> her, it, which is really strange because her mother was um, Maria Theresa of Austria, powerful, intelligent woman sat on the Austrian throne for I don't know how years did lots of public service, like introduced vaccines, did like a lot of good work for her people, but was like, oh, my girls just need to like be pretty and have babies. <laughs> like, <laughs> Get to work. Had, had no expectations that they should do anything she did. So she really just like was like, oh, yeah, here, you're going to be the perfect bride right <laughs> <laughs> let's go behind the wardrobe let's go behind the wardrobe we have director sofia coppola costume designer melina cananero hey. spencer we've heard this name before i am so excited we all know cananero we have heard her name before she is the designer of a clockwork orange Barry London, for which she received her first Oscar win, The Shining, Chariots of Fire, another Oscar win, The Cotton Club, Out of Africa, Oscar nomination, The Godfather Part 3, The Affair of the Necklace, another Oscar nomination, and a very weird movie that we should watch, <laughs> <laughs> Ocean's 12, The Wolfman, Grand Budapest Hotel, another Oscar win, and The French Dispatch. And Spencer, this woman is so incredible that we didn't even mention all of her Oscar nominations. She has nine Oscar nominations with four wins. Damn. Like, That's crazy. She, doesn't, she doesn't play around. She doesn't play around at all. She's one of those, like, iconic costume designers when, you know, just me talking to people, they're like, oh, this reminds me of, like, a Canon Arrow film. Like, you know, she's, like, that mm -hmm. synonymous with, like, just award-winning, just iconic. Yeah. Like, she has a room dedicated to all of her trophies for all of her <laughs> badass films she's designed. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, it sounds like Marie Antoinette was a little bit different. Um. NBC quoted her as saying about when she was first approached to do this film. Sophia gave me a box of macaroons from some company. I cannot pronounce their name. <laughs> we looked at them and the beautiful colors and they became a guideline in a way. We didn't do everything based off them, but they were definitely an inspiration and it's like, yes, this film is just little macaroons that you can just pop in your mouth and not worry about at all. I love that. This film was just so colorful and it just felt like the entire inspiration was just macaroons, candy, champagne, <laughs> lollipops, candy land. It was just all of that. 
Yeah, it definitely was. And uh, there is a fantastic article because last year was the 15th anniversary of the film. And Vogue did an incredible article by Keaton Bell called It Was Like Hosting the Ultimate Party, an Oral History of Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette. And it it's a great article. You all should read it. This article talks about the process of making it from like beginning to end. And at the time, Sophia was like a relatively new director. And she is like, you know, this needed such a large budget and needed like so much time and like everything needed to be perfect that she was thinking about making this film for a while, but knew nobody was going to give her the money until Lost in Translation with Scarlett Johansson and Bill Murray was such a success. And then she was like, I knew I'd be able to make whatever I wanted afterwards. And she was like, this is my chance to make Marie Antoinette. I love And that. was just like, let's go. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they got for what at the time was like a really good budget that 40 million, which today would be like just under 70 million. So like for like a pretty standard period piece, like a nice budget and it shows on screen. That is not bad. No, because it's like there's no special effects. There's like not like there's no CGI involved. It's just beautiful cinematography, beautiful set dressing, beautiful costumes. Dare I say this takes me back to our Dracula episode when Francis Ford Coppola said that the costumes of Dracula were the set. Mm -hmm. Honestly, the costumes were the set in this film, too. It runs in the family. So absolutely. Absolutely. And Sophia, she was like ready for this film. She talked to Vogue about her preparation for the film. She said, I made reference boards that had a lot of new romantic visuals and John Galliano's work at Dior. He designed some dresses inspired by Marie Antoinette. And I loved that mix of 18th century fashion and couture. Milena is a genius and completely understood what I was going for. She interpreted the era with such a fresh feeling and palette. Marie was into fashion, so we wanted the film to feel fashionable. And it does. <laughs> yeah. The entire thing feels like a runway show to me. It's so cool. It really is. And you know, you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of juicy guitars advertising yeah in the 2000s yeah. that's exactly like <laughs> i feel like the juicy guitar people looked at this and was like nice how can we make this obnoxious right <laughs> <laughs> did i ever tell you about the first time i went to a juicy guitar store no i was so massively disappointed because i just saw their art their advertisement in like teen vogue i never really like looked up like what they did i knew they did like scents and handbags but i didn't really like look up anything else because i was like i know i can't afford this and then we went to a really nice mall out here and they had a juicy guitar store and i went in i was so massively disappointed because <laughs> i was expecting like beautiful clothing not like velour tracks <laughs> <laughs> you're like i want to be marie antoinette <laughs> what is this <laughs> <laughs> so disappointed anyway at the time, though, while we rave about it now, at the time, it did not do very well. Uh, Sofia Coppola told Vogue, I'm so happy it has an audience now because at the time it was not successful. People didn't go see it. They didn't really know what to make of it. It means a lot to me that it continues to live on. This movie made six, 60 million nine hundred seventeen thousand one hundred and eighty nine dollars which like a tiny bit more than its budget right not not great <laughs> not great not great That's shocking and, to me um i guess you know now we even said this last week but now that i'm older and i could appreciate it i mean i just thought it was a flawless perfect film i really enjoyed it but i guess i could understand why people would not have loved this at the time yeah and she based it off, um, she based her script off a book, uh, Marie Antoinette, The Journey by Antonia Frazier. 
who was really looking at Marie Antoinette with a sympathetic lens because up until probably the early 2000s, people didn't really think of her that way. It was like, oh, this queen who indulged and then rightfully had her head chopped off. Like nobody right. thought <laughs> nobody thought to look at like, oh, like she did what she did because that's what she was told to do. Not because she was some evil person. <laughs> yeah, I remember going to school being like, today we're going to talk about Marie Antoinette again, that evil hag who told everyone to eat cake and she just ate macaroons all day. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wait, she didn't say that. She didn't say <laughs> right. that. It's like, okay, okay. <laughs> um, so, so does she not actually say that? Because it wasn't until when I saw the movie that I was like, oh, was that not true? Oh, no, she did not say that. Damn. She didn't know. That's some it was hardcore like, rumors because <laughs> yeah. I'm still clearing it up today. <laughs> I think I think that was writ that like line was written when she was a child, actually, and attributed nice. to someone else at the time. Uh no, she didn't say that. And like when he's like, God help us, we're too young to rule, he means it in the film. Like neither of them. Not, neither of them should be, should have been ruling anybody. Right. <laughs> Rightfully so. They were like taking like they should not have been in charge. Yeah. <laughs> but they also like the downfall of the French mon monarchy was Versailles. Because while it kept the nobles in line, it also kept the royal family disconnected from the people. And like her husband did not know how to like hit like his grandfather and I think probably great grandfather could kind of ride that line but he just did not know he didn't understand yeah <laughs> but anyway spencer after our break are you ready to just dive into the fountains of versailles i'm so excited i have a plate of macaroons here and i'm gonna see how many <gasps> i could fit in my mouth during the break oh my gosh i should have gotten macaroons i'll send you some i regret my decisions okay <laughs> Everybody, go get some macaroons and then come back. What's up, costume nerds? This is Spencer, co-host and producer of the Art of Costume Blogcast. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. We greatly appreciate all the support. If you want to continue in your support... You can become a costume maven at patreon.com slash the art of costume. There we post unheard bloopers, highlights, and bonus episodes for our costume mavens. You can even chat with other listeners and vote on future episodes. Head over to patreon.com slash the art of costume and subscribe now. to eat some cake i'm always ready to eat some cake especially if it looks like this entire film <laughs> oh my gosh i love this opening scene because i feel like this is like the image of marie antoinette especially at the time like lazy has a french maid to do everything for her yeah like just surrounded by luxury i really like the dress she's wearing because it's like just like an insane chemise <laughs> It, it looks it almost looks like that really like tacky like satin yeah like it looks ridiculous but it, i love that it kind of shows us like this is who you think she is now let's take it back but <laughs> i love that opening shot because to me this is just like i was already into the movie because i knew like oh this is gonna be an artsy film like that first shot could easily be like a portrait somewhere absolutely absolutely and sophia coppola she like put a lot of punk revolution into this uh starting with this opening scene it is modeled after uh the work of fashion french photographer guy bodin uh it is from a campaign he shot for charles jordan in 1977 yeah that's cool i love that and i did I'm glad he said that because I really feel like the punk influence in this entire film. Um, so I'm so excited to talk about it. This is just an opening shot. Like we haven't yeah. started a movie yet. 
No. <laughs> and it's like this very punky, like, could not care less image of her. And then it's just her as this girl leaving her home. <laughs> it, this entire like opening sequence reminded me of one of our favorite TV shows, The Great. Also, there's a lot of similarities. Mm-hmm. I mean, the nobility were constantly sending off their young women to <laughs> be married. Yeah, it was a different time. <laughs> it was Happened a very all the different time. time. <laughs> Happened constantly. Um, Marie though looks beautiful. You could tell, like, yes. Kristen Dunst, she looks so young, and you could just tell, like, this is about to be a person who's about to go on a wild adventure that she has no idea what's coming. Um, also, that pug, like, stop, so cute, right? Oh, my <laughs> mops when mops was taken from her. I was pretty, oh upset. my gosh, I it's like, no wonder this girl isn't happy. And I love how they kind of show, like, her excessive, like, lifestyle was, like, that, that, she was retail therapy shopping. Yes. <laughs> that was her trying to cope with the fact that everybody hated her <laughs> <laughs> for something she had, like, no part in. Like, it, it was not her fault. <laughs> right. Um, I was so stoked to see Marianne Faithful as marie's mother what yes. that is crazy when i saw on hulu that was for some reason the first name i was like marianne faithful and what the hell is she doing in this but it's her it's crazy the singer of broken english the bout of lucy jordan that's sick yeah yeah she i think i think she her mother was austrian because she talks about it in that article so she was like yeah i'll play maria Teresa." <laughs> Yeah, it's, that's dope. <laughs> oh my gosh. If you want to know about Maria Teresa and her, because I think Marie Antoinette was her youngest of like 16 children. Mm. This woman had like a buttload of kids. <laughs> um, uh, Lindsay Holiday, History Tea Time with Lindsay Holiday, has a couple of really great series because Maria Teresa, like, n didn't always do the right thing, but was an incredible female leader for her time. Right. I'll have to check it out. But Maria's um, costume we see her in in the beginning, though, you could tell, like, she is not, you know, we're about to see the world of France. She's not from there. Like, her costume says, like, she's Austrian. Just so many different influences. The colors are much darker and more set in, like, a realistic tone, I would say. Yeah. Because everything we're about to see is so, like, hyper fantasy mm -hmm. that maria is like the last bit of like realism we see before we jump into this looney tunes of a world we're about to dive into yes she's going from oh i think her original name was maria antonia yeah so she's like oh maria antonia sh shorter name simpler dress <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I, I, I love her her austrian looks because they're so childlike and I think in this film, it's hard to realize because they don't really talk about how old they are. But it's like, she's 14. Yeah. She's 14. <laughs> yeah, she's a baby. <laughs> she's a baby. And she's literally being stripped of everything she's ever known oh, man. to go marry this prince. And she comes out looking like an entirely different person. That first look, shut up, is so good. I already knew as soon as I'm like, okay, I'm going to love this film. That blue look with the hat. <gasps> to die for. Yeah. To die for. And I, I feel like this is really the iconic look from this movie. And I love it because it's like, she's so like green to everything that's going on. But I feel like they've replaced blue in the, or green in this movie with blue. Yeah. <laughs> like she's just this like powdery, fresh baby who doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> right. I knew this look and I've never even seen this film, but I recognize this look from, you know, just being a human and seeing pictures of this costume f since 2006. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And we meet the first person she meets is um Duchess Deschar, I think. I, I'll be honest, keeping track of anybody who is not Marie Antoinette in this film is very hard. Very difficult. Very difficult. But she meets this woman who's basically going to be like her guide through the French court. And I love she just has this like very stark 
red jacket and just like the huge skirt and she was like welcome to france <laughs> played by judy davis I, I love her she's brilliant um she was recently in ratchet oh really yeah she's great i mean she, judy davis has been in you know two million things but that's why i saw her in recently yeah yeah um she, yeah she was a great character i also will mention that i feel like some of these characters definitely just disappear though at some point in the film yeah you'll have well, to point it out to me because i think it's once they become king and queen yeah you see a lot of characters drop off and kind of like who her friends are because mm -hmm. um who's the woman who plays moaning myrtle she's in this film what yeah i don't remember that um you can You're tell saying moaning myrtle is not just a one-time ghost that we saw in the harry potter films <laughs> she is not <laughs> um but you know the two kind of like middle-aged women yeah who are kind of like around her at first molly shannon and the other girl yeah, the the shorter one with like the funny voice. You didn't you don't recognize that funny voice? Well, oh, now I'm looking at it. Yeah, you're so right. That is her Shirley yeah. Henderson. Shirley Henderson, yeah. <laughs> no, I was distracted because that was Molly Shannon in a period film. Like that was very distracting to yeah. me. In a good like I love her to death, a superstar yeah, yeah, yeah. forever. But I was like, is that Molly Shannon? What are you doing here? <laughs> good stuff. Oh, such a such a good stuff. Um I love this undressing scene, which is just so awkward and cringy compared to all of our dressing scenes. But I, uh, <laughs> I still love it, though. You know, I just love any sort of period dressing, undressing, yeah. even if it's like uncomfortable for the characters. I'm like, I just love this process. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, also very awkward and cringy. Their wedding. Ugh. Awkward, like I said, awkward and cringy for them, but for me, just so full of joy. <laughs> These costumes were so so beautiful. beautiful. Those large paniers, and do you know? Oh, ridiculous! Huge, ridiculous. Do you know what's called um, those like drapes on the back of the dress? Is there a specific name for it? There is, and I am blanking on it because I was actually thinking about it the other day, and I was like, "Oh, that's so beautiful," and I don't remember. So cool. I'm sure there's a historical costume fellow nerd listening to us who's getting ready to scream. Who's already screaming. Yeah, who's already uh -huh. screaming. <laughs> Look, Elizabeth and I have not had our coffee today. We're really going for it. No. <laughs> I made the mistake of just drinking a chai when I got home. I should have actually had coffee. Um, but yeah, it's this beautiful dress. And it is inspired by like her wedding gown while... Well, I don't think any of Marie Antoinette's clothes survived, even though she wore something new. She never wore the same thing twice. And she doesn't in this movie either. Which I'm just like, financially, how and why? But um, I love they have like, it's very clearly there's this engraving of them on their wedding day. And then there's just this famous portrait of her, which I, I kind I don't think it's her wedding gown. But it's it's giving me like the vibes of what um, they decided on for the film. Definitely what like, they were going for. Yeah. And I'm like, that's like a beautiful combination of the two. OK, I, I have a point of reference. It is called a sack back gown. Yes. There we go. Hello. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> they keep the nerds off our backs. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel so stupid because I like spent a lot of time in college learning all of these terms. And then now when I need them. Right. <laughs> they're just not there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you could definitely see like the reference to like just paintings of Marie Antoinette. Yeah. Maybe this isn't exactly what her dress looked like, but it's probably pretty damn close yes apparently it was completely silver and covered in diamonds of course of course because the french just couldn't do anything halfway at the time <laughs> um another very iconic aspect of marie antoinette that we really actually don't get to see in the film is her wigs and lena talked about just the creation of uh, Kirsten Dunst's Marie Antoinette a little bit and NBC quotes her as saying I got to take this counter age sort of story about a girl who's a, a fashion victim in a way 
She starts out very young and innocent, but we get to watch her grow through the movie. I started by throwing pieces of material at Kirsten to see what colors suited her best. I hardly used wigs because they weren't right for her. We thought that maybe we could have gone more crazy, but there was just not time. And she was like, she also talks about this in the Vogue article where she's like, it, like the wigs just like didn't suit Kirsten Dunst. Right. Like they just weren't right for her and like the overall look they wanted for Kirsten Dunst as Marie Antoinette. But we do get this really incredible scene where she does wear a ridiculous wig. Right. We do get it a little bit. I get what Melina was saying. She's like, you know, it didn't always work because sometimes the environment around her was so crazy and over the top that she didn't always yes. need to be over the top herself. It, you know, it still got the point across. Still got the point across. And I love the the wig maker in the movie. You get to see him a couple of times. And he is, like, outrageous enough. It's like, okay, you understand, like, what's going on with her hair just by the virtue of how outrageous right. <laughs> the man doing her hair is. I love the scene where, like, it's her birthday and she's, like, falling into the candles and he just blows everything out. Because yeah. he's like, hey, don't... Don't you dare mess up my piece of art. Right. <laughs> Watching this almost made me go and grab the wig from our episode of The Great. Almost. But it's also almost not. 100 degrees outside and I don't want my my head to yeah, set on no. fire. <laughs> yeah, no. We don't, we don't need a Marie Antoinette at her birthday moment. Um, uh, Odile Gilbert, though, who was the hair designer on Marie Antoinette, spoke to Vogue about you know, the whole process. He said, I wanted Marie's hair to be extravagant while still within the bounds of reality. I designed her hair through the lens that she's a young, rich kid without any sense of reality. So anything is possible. She goes through phases. So sometimes it was massive and sometimes she wears it down. I would say I designed around 30 looks, but didn't sketch anything. I would just start styling Kirsten's hair and Sophia would say, that's so cute. I love it. <laughs> it makes it sound so easy. <laughs> <I know>. Right? <laughs> There's no way it was that easy. <laughs> I, I love these like des like designers sometimes. They're like, oh, yeah, I just did a thing. Yeah. And it, it turned out fine. I'm just like, what? Did a Marie Antoinette look, but I didn't even have to write it down. <laughs> yeah. And we get lots of Marie Antoinette looks just within the first couple of days of her living at the castle. All very... Very, I want to say, like, Revolutionary War-esque, because, again, this is reminding me of American Girl Dolls, but <laughs> it's very French Rococo, lots of beautiful florals, light, fluffy colors, just, and everything is embellished to the nines. Yeah, there's a ruffle on everything, and if there's not a ruffle, there's a bow, if it's not a bow... There's I don't, <laughs> all sorts of stuff coming off flowers, feathers. I love the opening looks, though, because it is interesting when Marie gets there. She's really like playing the part. Yes. Um, she's trying to fit into all the rules, dress the way that she's supposed to dress. And it's not really until that she actually becomes queen where you see like the evolution of like simple, just kind of doing what she's supposed to and to just like full on punk revolution fashion show like every other scene so these yeah it's really fun to like now that i've seen the entire film go back to the beginning and just really see the evolution in her costumes absolutely absolutely and i love the scenes where her and louis are together because <laughs> like i feel like they low-key match a little bit yeah. <laughs> a lot of the time even though despite how like fantastical this film is like the historical accuracy is like top notch so <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> usually you don't say that but what we watch <laughs> uh, usually i don't but they they really did a good job in this one um of making it fresh and accurate like at the same time um but i love how they low-key match all the time and they're just like really adorable together like not at all suited 
no. to be married to each other. But I like that, that like they just kind of respect each other. <laughs> I was so hot and cold on Louis. I was like, okay, this guy definitely does not want to be here. He kind of sucks. Oh. But then you're like, oh, like this isn't his fault either. Like this no. is just also a young guy who wants to stay home and play video games. He really does not care. <laughs> so, like I was really conflicted on him the entire time. Yeah, he like really just wants to like hunt and like make keys and like that's all he really wants to do with his life. Like he doesn't care about the rest of it. Yeah, they want him to stay up for the sunrise at one point. He's like, the only time I wake up that early is when I go hunting, which by yeah. the way is every day. So yeah. <laughs> They have a lot in this movie. I yeah. forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> but we have, oh my gosh, she was like, uh, she's hardly in the movie, but she's one of my favorite characters, An Madame Duberry. Yeah, An, she's so dope. <laughs> an absolute icon. It's, oh, I think, I hope I'm getting the this, I think she's the French mistress. There are a lot of French mistresses because it was an official title within the court. Oh. Um, <laughs> that's sweet that was actually one of ranch when it's problems is that louis did not have an official mistress <laughs> yeah so all criticism went to her um anyway <laughs> madame du Barry, in real life she was famous for having her nipples pierced and wore like low cut sheer tops so people could see her like her um the different uh piercings she had for them like she would have like di like diamond encrusted like <laughs> swans and stuff okay um <laughs> and i I'm like, am writing all of this down <laughs> and i will be doing my own research after the podcast <laughs> i was like I, I know there was a french mistress who did that and i'm like 90 percent sure it was her because she was uh, that's a very bold statement if it's not her so if not yeah. <laughs> we're gonna have to have a follow-up <laughs> conversation <laughs> she was wild and everybody hated her because they loved the last official mistress and she just like did not <laughs> stack up she had big shoes to fill <laughs> <laughs> she had to follow up madame de pompadour so <laughs> 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 i love this um yeah so when you see madame du berry um her costumes are off the chain she is oh, if i say off the chain one more time please punish me i cannot be saying off the chain or cool your jets anymore <laughs> anyways um <laughs> she's giving me like alexander mcqueen when i see her uh just so much fabric it's just beautiful. Yes. The colors are dark and gothic. She clearly does not fit in here. Everyone hates her, but they all hate to love her, too, because she always looks so good. And if she's rocking some diamond-encrusted nipple piercings underneath, too, I love her <laughs> even more. But Right, I, right. I need to fact check that one first, though. Hold on. <laughs> oh, Elizabeth's live fact checking it right now. Daniel, we need like some Jeopardy music or something. <laughs> do, 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 okay, do, have to do, this do, later. It may have been a different French mistress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, we man. will update on the Instagram. Um, I found an article, but it was very long. Um, okay, we'll do a follow up for you all next week. Anyway, anyway, gosh, that was one of the things I meant to like look up before we did this podcast, and I completely forgot about it. It's all right. But like I anyway, said, I'm gonna go to bed tonight and just do my own research. So we'll figure it yeah. out. Yeah, we'll figure it out together. Um, as did Asia Arganto, who played Madame de Berry and Lena Cananero. Uh, Arganto said to Vogue, I started to get an idea of who de Berry was through working with Melina. We had meetings so she could study my face and body before I even met Sophia. <laughs> they wanted my character to look different from the rest of Versailles. She chose a lot of deep reds and purples for me compared to the pastels of all the other girls wear to show that DuBerry wasn't like them. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And Canonero says, also to Vogue, 
I dressed her like an exotic bird in contrast to the rather naive, innocent queen in waiting. (laughs) I love that. I mean, it's the best way to put it. Like, just looking at her, you're like, okay, she does not belong here. I don't know who that person is, but she clearly did not get the dress code. No, no, she didn't. Well, she didn't have to. She was allowed to do whatever she wanted. The king didn't care. The king loved it. (laughs) The king was like, yeah. (laughs) French mistress. Woo. Woo. (laughs) (laughs) But I do love, because like, like, I mean, people wore jewelry at the time, but it wasn't, it wasn't as big as it had been in the past to wear jewelry. And I love that she's just decked out in so much jewelry that perfectly matches every single outfit she has. Yeah, I mean, she knew what she was doing. She yeah. knew how to put a look together. It just really upset everyone the way that she did it. It just wasn't yeah. macaroon enough for them, honestly. No, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't. But uh, unfortunately, neither her or the king were longed to stay at Versailles. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer, after our break, are you ready to see Marie Antoinette, the Queen of France? Yeah, heads will roll. Eventually. (laughs) Hi, this is Dan, audio engineer of the Blogcast, here to let you know that if you wanted to support the show, you can head over to theartofcostume.com slash podstore. There you can buy some awesome T Public merch with the Blogcast logo. We have shirts, sweaters, coffee mugs, stickers, and of course, a baby onesie. Thank you for all of your support. ready for our favorite activity a ball a ball (laughs) not just any ball a mass ball Uh, i love the scene i think it was probably my favorite i think it was my favorite too because it's just so fun everybody's having a good time except for louis who got himself into a very awkward cringy (laughs) conversation right (laughs) but definitely her new friend the duchess is having just the best time ever and rose brin who played her said for the duchess cannonero had this intuitive understanding of what sophia's interpretation of an 18th century party girl would look like i wore a few costumes that marisa branson wore in barry london which tickled me Marisa was also once an it girl of her time. So would so to be wearing her costumes for Sophia's movie felt very special. So I feel like this is almost a first where it's like, oh, this amazing film with all these amazing costumes. Not everything was made for the film. Right. <laughs> it was awesome. I loved Rose's character, the Duchess. Uh, she was such a fun character. I know she was supposed to be like... Maybe she's not a great influence all the time, but to me, she was just like a good time. She's a party and she always looked good. Her her ball look in this like emerald green was so stunning on her. So stunning. And so was uh, Kirsten Dunst's all black look. Oh, yeah. Like it really looks like she's like, I'm just going to escape out into the night. And she meets... The most charming Swedish officer who <laughs> looks like he dressed up just to compliment her. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was a cool guy. I love that look on him. It's very, you know, official, very uniform, but something about it just feels so like punk also, you know, like yeah, this is I think it's like the a black. real, yeah, it's, he's a real cool guy. He real smokes cool. cigarettes after and, you know, I don't know does cool stuff (laughs) (laughs) 
which is not saying smoking is cool, but like, this is my vision. <laughs> as he rides a cigarette in his mouth, as he rides off to battle. Yeah. On a um, motorcycle. <laughs> but also, again, I felt like her and Louis matched a little bit. Like, yeah. <laughs> I feel like she's almost trying to be this really cute couple with him and it just doesn't it never works out no they're too goofy together but like we love them for it we do Um, marie's black costume is incredible i love it it's definitely one of my favorites it's just so edgy and also Mm -hmm. like also just like very punk and unexpected you see her come out of the carriage and we're so used to like all these balls we talk about on the podcast being very big and flashy and maybe it's like bright yellow or you know hot pink she came on all black and i was like okay like yeah you know how i feel about black so i was very thrilled okay marie get it yeah. um <laughs> yeah it's definitely very like seductive and just like i think this is the first time like she's really like enjoying herself And really just, like, getting out there and, like, ooh, let me just go, like, mix and mingle with these people. Yeah, she just wants to put on a cool black outfit and go. This is essentially her way of going out clubbing. You know, she's like, I want to go out. I want to look good. I want to look hot and go out. Yeah. That's what she does. That's exactly (laughs) what she does. But uh, she doesn't get to do that for long because now she's got to be queen. Yeah, old Daddy Louie got um, smallpox. It happens. Yeah. Yeah, Grant, <laughs> Grandpa was not la- long for this world. Um, <laughs> uh, but she wears this beautiful white and gold gown. And it's just like, it's probably the most simple thing she wears, but it's striking. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's very... um it's the colors are just so regal. Um, she looks very divine. Like she looks like this like goddess queen. She's here, an angel walking down this like dark blue carpet. It's just so stunning. It is very simple compared to everything she wears, which mm-hmm. doesn't really say much because most of the things she wears are very complicated. Yeah. Um, it's incredible. I love this look. One of my tops also. One of the tops, one of the tops. Also, another iconic piece. Right after the coronation is her birthday. Like, again, like, kind of simple, but beautiful feathers, beautiful flower applique. There's just this, like, teal accent in the front. And it's like, even though it's simple, she's still going all out. Yeah, I love this look. Um, This is also one of those looks that I recognize without even seeing the movie um, beforehand. It's like the simple white gown, but has like the flowers um, and like that red contrast feather in the hair. Mm -hmm. I just love that the way they contrast on her because she always will do like maybe like kind of like a muted color with like just very popping contrast on it, Mm -hmm. you know, mixed with like the lipstick she has on. It's very striking and she looks amazing. This looks like a fun birthday. Right, right. <laughs> Just gamble and drink till the sun comes up. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm here for that. Um, also, when she finally has a baby, she's given this little country retreat. <laughs> uh, it's still on the palace grounds. So, right. <laughs> but it felt like a whole different world. Um, I went to the kitchen for a real quick second when her brother was, you know, hanging out with the elephant. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll be right back. I walk into the kitchen, get myself my sandwich. I come back out. She's in the countryside with a child. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why don't you use the pause button on your... Just pause the movie. Just pause the show, Spencer. I swear. It was all of 60 seconds. (laughs) I then paused rewinded because i was like when does she have a kid yeah she had a kid that's crazy good for her yeah and (laughs) it's she's wearing again these like simple country looks but they're filled with like frills and the fabric it looks like plain at first but it's got all these beautiful little embroideries on it and the panniers and the the ribbon she's wearing and it's just all it's all like she's playing out this like 
fantasy of being a farmer and it's like you're no farmer right that's how i felt the whole time i'm like is this like an act where she's just outside there's just like random lambs walking around and chickens i'm like what farm is this beautiful all the time it's the one marie antoinette built for herself in real life (laughs) but i love it though and i and our notes you include this uh, portrait of Marie Antoinette, which I'm very familiar with. We've all seen this portrait a thousand times, but like, this is definitely the inspiration for this scene because Marie Antoinette did have like sometimes a simple side where she probably was playing this part. Like, Oh, I'm a country girl today. Like I'm going to wear this huge hat with feathers, but I am also going to go pretend to work in the fields for a little bit. That's what this reminds me of. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, she wanted just kind of like a simple family life. Like that's kind of what she was raised with was a simple family life. But obviously as queen of France, she was never going to get that. So it's like, she was definitely just like running away to this little fake farm she had. And her fantasy continues when she decides to take up opera. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I love this scene. I love this. It's so funny. It's so funny and awkward. This made me laugh so hard because, you know, obviously us knowing how the story Marie Antoinette ends, you're like, the world around her is fully falling apart. And she's like, listen to me sing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I love, I love her outfit. It's just this like, again, the baby blue skirt. But then this like, I feel like. I like it's a very like Americana print corset. Right. Like this just like random like pastoral scene in red and just so simple. And she really looks beautiful, but it's like, girl, not the time or place. (laughs) (laughs) This is again her idea of like, oh, what does a peasant dress like? I'm sure they wear a little like chic corset with this baby blue Mm -hmm. and a little like hair moment and like clearly very disconnected from reality which is why i love it like this very high fashion fantasy version of what she thinks a peasant would look like absolutely absolutely and it just continues she just continues to kind of like seem to just want this simple life but like at right at the moment where she needs to be like paying attention and not doing stupid things like wearing pink wigs to greet the soldiers <laughs> oh man that look is one of my favorites with the hot pink wig oh, oh my i guess gosh, it's more of a pastel yes. pink wig with the mm-hmm. pink outfit the whole thing i i almost said this was my one costume rule them all but it's not but it's like very close it's such a good one it's very close and it's again one of those iconic looks from the movie and w- one thing that was so annoying about this film it was really hard to get good pictures because this is like just as digital is like coming right <laughs> into the picture with film so like most films were still shot on film so it's like everything's like a little bit grainy and like a little like not great and because it's like 2006 there's not a ton of images on it of it on the internet so i had a really hard time finding this this pink look of hers but it's like it's such a good one it's such a good one i love it a lot (laughs) (laughs) also we get another very iconic scene (laughs) and look from marie antoinette when uh she is just wearing nothing but her socks and garters for the Swiss officer. Uh, um, yeah, this is a cool scene. I like it a lot. Um, <laughs> Kristen Dunst looks so good in this scene. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's perfect. It is perfect. I, I was like, do I- love the colors. I will say that from a costume point of view, like that pink with again, like that very like baby blue and a white. It it says a lot about like it became a costume with the fan, but yeah. Other than that, I yeah, good scene, very very nice. (laughs) (laughs) My eye. (laughs) Oh no, Elizabeth fell over. (laughs) Um, Yes, fantastic scene, (laughs) great costuming. (laughs) Also, (laughs) that's nice. 
<laughs> but no, yeah. it's that that scene of her with the fan, super iconic. Like we see a cropped version of that all the time in relationship to the movie. Like you don't get that whole picture, but you get to see like a cropped version of it a lot. Right. Also, a kind of iconic and just very punk look is the let them eat cake in the bathtub right like <laughs> scene the, the cruella the vill moment i was like who yes. is this vivian westwood model telling us to eat cake right now because i will <laughs> yeah. if she's telling me to i will <laughs> ma'am i'll do whatever you tell me to do <laughs> i do like cake <laughs> i know i love this just like evil marie real it's all of like three seconds but they've got that like nearly black lipstick a pair of earrings and necklace that i think she's been wearing throughout the film but it's like this turn it's almost looks like a little tarnished or like black yeah and it's just like it like is such the opposite of everything we've seen so far it makes you jump for a second right it's it's evil antoinette it's scary (laughs) it is scary and then it just gets sad yeah it just gets sad she loses her baby this really (laughs) fell apart like really quickly yeah like overnight she there's a good portion of the the end of the film a lot of it she's just wearing black she's just in mourning she it's like she's starting to understand her role right when she's about to lose it (laughs) yeah a little late on that marie um you know how i love a funeral look her grieving black veiled look i mean i know we're supposed to be mourning a (laughs) but she looks so good Yeah, she she is mourning her child, but she is looking good doing it. Yeah, it, it's the hat with the veil. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what that's what makes that look. It's so good. Also, her I couldn't keep my eyes off her. No, and then her nightgown look, exquisite. Like it was so simple, and like the way it moved with her when she's like bowing down on the balcony, beautiful. Yeah, and I like it too because it's almost like she's accepted her fate at this point. She's like, well, we really screwed it on <laughs> this job. Yeah. Um, so she goes out there in this nightgown and she has, it's like a little bit of like the old Marie where it has like still like these like little pops of color in it. It's hard to tell because there's people with pitchforks and torches. Literally. But if you <laughs> look closely, you can see like little pops of color that feels very Marie. It's like she's gonna go out swinging in her favorite nightgown she is she is but that is all marie leaves versailles never to return again no things don't really end well for her and her husband or a bunch of people really yeah her daughter was the only one that made it out yeah i believe they call it uh, the reign of terror yeah (laughs) yeah Good times. Uh, (laughs) But what was not terrifying was all the costumes in this film. There's so many good ones. I'm very excited to play our favorite game, Elizabeth. Yes. Daniel, hit it. The one costume to rule them all. Spencer, what was your one costume to rule them all? I was very torn on this one. I was really leaning toward that all pink look Mm -hmm. and also that all blue look from the beginning. But to me, I just felt like that black look she wears to the ball, the Marie badass Antoinette look, the (laughs) Marie the Punisher Antoinette (laughs) look is so badass with like the black um, covering her eyes it's very like Alexander McQueen and Vivian Westwood. Yeah, It's just so edgy and it's just not what you're expecting. Um, you're thinking like maybe like a more historical accurate period moment where she would obviously be wearing something, I don't know, blue or yellow or pink. She chose black and that was very rock and roll. And that's just, you know, that I love that as an aesthetic. So definitely my favorite. Easy. I do love that. Yeah, this is like that is probably the least historically accurate piece in this film. And I love it, too, because it, it really says everything like Sofia Coppola wanted right. to say with this movie that like this was just a young woman trying to enjoy her life 
and who didn't really know any better because she wasn't expected to. Right. It was a very bold choice, honestly. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Similarly, my one costume to rule them all was the baby blue French outfit she is put into when she arrives in France because it's just like it's iconic it's it says everything you need to know about her innocence and like just kind of like oh like this is someone who was very unprepared for what was about to happen to her right (laughs) it's so beautiful though it gives me like you know, obviously it's very French. It reminds me of Harry Potter and a Goblet of Fire when yes. Flora Delacour shows up, you know, in the blue and the hats. It's very chic. It's very, very chic and proper, but also still like fashion forward, too. Absolutely. And with that, we are at the end. Elizabeth, what are we watching next week? Ooh, next week, Spencer, we are watching The White Lotus. Ooh, finally. We're going on a little vacation. Yeah, it's hot girl summer vacation week to a beautiful (laughs) Hawaiian island at the resort of the White Lotus. And Jennifer Coolidge is going to be there, so I'm ready. My gosh, I can't wait to just talk about Jennifer Coolidge the whole time. (laughs) That's all I'm going to do. That's all I'm going to do is talk about Jennifer Coolidge the entire show. And Sydney Sweeney. I have a real crush on Sydney Sweeney. I, I hadn't seen her in anything because I don't I've never watched um Euphoria. <sighs> but she's amazing. Yeah. She's I amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. If you loved this episode, make sure you hit up our voicemail number 626-515-1826. If you, you know, maybe don't want to leave a voicemail, you can also just hit us up at the Art of Costume pod on Instagram, TikTok at the Art of Costume. Uh, You can follow our Patreon and hear our voices just like an extra time every month at patreon.com slash the Art of Costume. If you want a little like merch, you can head to the Art of Costume.com slash pod store, get a tote bag, get a t-shirt, Put your baby in a onesie of ours. <laughs> you want to raise them right, don't you? <laughs> raise your children correct, because one day they could end up the queen of another country, and things could go yeah. wrong for them. I'm just saying. Yeah. Give them an appreciation for costume design so that they avoid these mistakes. <laughs> Leave us a voicemail at 626-515-1826. Tell, tell me why that black look that Marie wears is the one costume to rule them all. Yeah. Let me know why the baby blue number is the one costume to rule them all. And if you just love the pod overall, please leave us a little five-star text review on Apple Podcasts and or Spotify. It really helps us out. Everybody have a magical hot girl summer week. <laughs> Au revoir, my friends. Au revoir. <laughs> The Art of Costume Blogcast is hosted and produced by Elizabeth Joy Glass and Spencer Williams. Our audio engineering and editing is done by Dan White. Follow us on Instagram at The Art of Costume Pod or visit theartofcostumeblogcast.com for all blogcast updates. If you want to support the show, go to theartofcostume.com slash podstore. Or you can head over to patreon.com slash theartofcostume for some bonus content. For more costume reviews, deep dives, and interviews, head over to theartofcostume.com, a blog dedicated to highlighting the best in costume design. From her marriage to the French Dauphin Louis at 14, to and their rise to the throne at 19, Marie Antoinette is a modern retelling of France's most iconic, but ill-fated queen. Um, 
I left the two in there by accident. I'm sorry. Daniel, one more time. Jesus Christ. <laughs> we should just pack it up. <laughs>